Like syllogistic logic, propositional logic also contains standard argument forms. There are two general types of argument forms, valid forms and invalid forms. These are some types of valid argument forms, modus ponens, uh, the shorthand for modus ponens is MP, modus tollens, the shorthand for modus tollens is MT, pure hypothetical syllogism, and the shorthand for this is HS, disjunctive syllogism, and the shorthand for this is DS, and constructive dilemma, and the shorthand for this is CD. You're going to have to become familiar with their shorthand for these argument forms because you will end up using these shorthands for um, each of the argument forms in doing natural deductive proofs. Here are some invalid argument forms, affirming the consequent and denying the antecedent. Let's look at these forms in a little bit more detail. First of all, we have here modus ponens. Modus ponens is any uniform substitution instance using simple or compound statements of the argument form P then Q, P so Q. So I'm going to walk into the frame here. This is the argument form of the modus ponens. Notice that the argument form is actually given to you using statement variables. So you can actually replace the P here or the Q here and the P here and the Q here with any statement either simple or compound, okay? So these variables here stand for any type of statement, okay? Not a specific type of statement, okay? So notice that the form here is structured such that you have two premises, okay, and one conclusion. So this is a syllogism, okay? And the first premise is a conditional statement. Okay, P then Q. And the second premise will be the statement P that is asserted as the antecedent of the conditional statement if P then Q. And the conclusion will be the statement that is asserted as the consequent of the conditional statement if P then Q. Okay? So you have the two premises here, if P then Q, P, and then the conclusion Q. Okay? So this is the general form of the modus ponens. Now this form can actually be represented in different arguments in different ways. So consider this here, okay? Here's an example of an argument that is also a modus ponens. When you look at this argument, okay, notice that the first premise here, labeled one, okay, is a conditional statement. How do we know it's a conditional statement? The main operator of this statement is the conditional horseshoe, which is right here. Now remember, we discussed how the main operator brings together the two largest components of a statement. And this main operator, the horseshoe, brings together this component here, which is the antecedent of the conditional, and this here, which is the consequent of the conditional. Okay? So, in this statement here, if you're going to relate this to the general form of the modus ponens, this compound statement that makes up the antecedent will be the P that is in this form here, okay? And this statement here that makes up the consequent of the conditional statement will be the Q, okay, that makes up this form here, okay? And then notice here on the second premise, you have the assertion of the conjunction that is given to you as the antecedent of the conditional. So the antecedent of the conditional is P dot Q, and notice how Premise two is the antecedent of the conditional P dot Q, okay? So this will be associated with the P that is in this form here, okay? And then finally for the conclusion, notice that the conclusion is actually the consequent of the conditional statement given in the first premise. Notice that here in the first premise, the consequent is G dot tilde D, Okay? And the conclusion is G dot tilde D. Okay? So this here, the conclusion, is the same statement as the consequent of the conditional. Now, keep in mind that although the second premise and the conclusion okay, occur as parts of the first premise, okay, which is a conditional statement, these are three different statements. Okay? The first statement is a conditional statement that is made up of the parts that are in the conclusion and the second premise. And the second premise is a statement okay, that is also given in the conditional statement. And the conclusion is a statement that is also given in the conditional statement. Okay? So although these are related to each other, these are three separate statements. Okay? Statement number two is not a conditional statement. 
Okay? Statement number three is not a conditional statement. Okay? And statement number one is a conditional statement. Okay? Now let's look at this example here. So this example here also uses the form of the modus ponens. Okay? Notice that here we have in the second statement, okay, which is the second premise listed here, okay, you have the conditional statement. Okay? How do we know that this second statement is the conditional statement? Because the conditional horseshoe is the main operator. Remember once again, the main operator is the operator that brings together the two largest parts of a compound statement. And in this case, we have this part here, which is half of the compound statement that is the conditional, and this part will be the P that is correlated with the form here, okay? And then the second part is this part here, this component here, the M wedge C, and this will make up the Q of the form here, P then Q, okay? So here you have the conditional statement given to you as the second premise, not the first premise. Okay? But it actually doesn't matter which order these premises are given to you. Okay? What you would need to do in this case to illustrate the proper form of this argument is to simply flip the premises. Okay? And then if we look at the first premise here, we notice that the first premise okay, actually makes up or is the antecedent of the conditional statement here. Okay? So this is P. Okay, which is also correlated with the P here in this argument form of the modus ponens. Okay? And the conclusion here okay, is the consequent of the conditional statement. Okay? So M wedge C, M wedge C. So this makes up the Q that is correlated not only with the consequent of the conditional statement, but the Q that is here represented in this form. Okay? So although these two arguments are different arguments in the sense that they use different statements, okay, they are both arguments that use the form of the modus ponens. Okay? And you have to be able to make sure that you can identify what kind of general form an argument is making. Okay? Now, let's look at this argument here. Notice that this argument here is not using the form of the modus ponens, okay? So this argument here actually does not correlate with this form that is given to you over here. How do you know that? Well, first thing, the first premise here, okay, statement number one, is actually not a conditional statement. And you know that it's not a conditional statement because the main operator here is the wedge. Okay? And a statement that has a wedge is a disjunction. It's not a conditional. So already we know that this argument does not follow the form of the modus ponens because for the modus ponens, notice, you have to have a conditional statement as one of the premises. Okay? And here you don't have a conditional statement. You have a disjunction. Okay, so now let us assume, okay? let's assume that this was a conditional horseshoe okay? instead of a wedge. Okay? this would still not be a modus ponens. Why not? Because although you have a conditional statement in one of the premises, okay, the second premise is not the assertion of the antecedent of the conditional. Notice how the second statement, which is the second premise, is simply L, okay? whereas the antecedent of the conditional statement is a conditional, L horseshoe Q. Okay? So in this case, it's also not a modus ponens. Okay? Now let's assume that the second statement, which is the second premise, was L horseshoe Q. Okay? Even if this is the case, this would not be a modus ponens. Why? Because look at the conclusion. Okay? The conclusion is not the consequent of the conditional statement. The conclusion is Q, whereas the consequent of the conditional statement is R wedge F. Okay? So, in order for this to be a modus ponens, okay, you would have to change the conclusion, take the Q out, okay, and make it R wedge S. Now, with all these changes, this argument, which would be a different argument, okay, would be a modus ponens. However, the argument as it is given, okay, is not a modus ponens. So this would not illustrate the form of a modus ponens, okay? Now let's look at this one here. 
Okay? This also is not a modus ponens. It does not take the form of the modus ponens. Why is that the case? Well, once again, the first premise, okay, or at least one of these premise, okay, is not a conditional statement. Okay? Notice that this statement here, the first statement, is a disjunction again. Okay? We know that because the main operator is the wedge. Okay? And the second statement, which is the second premise, is a simple statement. Okay? So because we don't have a conditional statement here, we know that it is not a modus ponens. Okay? Now again, let's assume in this case that here, this was a conditional statement. Okay? But even if this was a conditional statement, as with this one, this would still not be a modus ponens because of this second premise here, statement number two. Why? Because the second premise here, statement number two, is not the antecedent of the conditional statement. The antecedent of the conditional statement is L for Q, Q, whereas statement two is simply L. Okay? So what we would have to do in order to make this into a modus ponens is to change the L into L horseshoe Q, okay? And if we made these two changes, which would basically change the argument itself, okay, we would actually end up with a modus ponens. We would have a conditional statement, okay, as one of the premises, and as a second premise, we would have the antecedent of the conditional statement, so L horseshoe Q is the antecedent of the conditional statement. And then we have as the second premise, L horseshoe Q. And then as the conclusion, we would have the consequent of the conditional statement. So as a conclusion, we have R wedge S. And the consequent of the conditional statement would be R wedge S. Okay? So if we made these two changes here then, okay, we would have a modus ponens. But we'd also have a different argument. Okay? So because these changes were not here as the argument was given to you, okay? This is not a modus ponens, okay? So, not a modus ponens, okay? Now, another thing to understand about modus ponens is that any argument, basically, that takes this form, okay, this structure, okay, will be a valid argument. How do we know that? Well, we can actually construct a truth table for the modus ponens to determine that this form itself, based on the structure alone, will always be valid, okay? So notice here we did a truth table. I already completed the truth table, okay? We have the first premise here, then we have the second premise here, which is P, and then we have the conclusion Q, okay? And we have then this here underneath the horseshoe are all the possible truth values that this statement can have, and here we have underneath the P all the possible truth values that the statement P can have, and here we have Q underneath that all the possible truth values that Q can have. And if you look here, there is no row here, okay, where you would have all true premises and a false conclusion. Notice how when this is true, okay, and this is true, it's also the case that the conclusion will be true, okay? And in none of the other cases do you have all true premises, okay? So here we have false, true, with a false conclusion, okay? True, false, with a true conclusion, okay? And true, false, with a false conclusion, okay? So there is no row in the truth table for this argument form, the modus ponens, where you can possibly have all true premises and a false conclusion, okay? Because of that, this will be a valid argument form, meaning that any argument that takes this form will always be valid. One other thing is that when you consider the validity of an argument form that is the modus ponens, think of it in ordinary language, okay? If you think of it in ordinary language, it should make intuitive sense to you why an argument of this form is going to always be valid, okay? So for example, if the first premise is something like, if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, and the second premise was something like, Socrates was human, then from those two premises, you could validly conclude the conclusion that Socrates was mortal, okay? So any statement that takes these forms, okay, when put together in an argument in such a way, will give you a valid conclusion, okay? You can also think of it in terms of what the premises are doing. Now remember, a conditional statement is saying that if P, the antecedent, is the case, then you will always have the consequent Q, okay? So P is a sufficient condition for Q 
okay? So if this is what the conditional statement is saying, and we also have the other statement that P is the case, okay, the antecedent of the conditional, then it makes sense that the conclusion, which is the consequent of the conditional, will follow, okay? Okay, let's move on to another valid form. This is called the modus tollens. It's MT for short, okay? And the modus tollens is any uniform substitution instance using simple or compound statements of the argument form here, okay? So P horseshoe Q as the first premise, tilde Q as the second premise, and then tilde P for the conclusion, okay? So notice again that this form here is using statement variables, so you can actually replace the P's and the Q's, okay, consistently throughout the argument with any statement, okay? Any simple statement or any compound statement. So let's look at examples of modus tollens that are a little bit more complex. This is an example of a modus tollens. Why is it an example of a modus tollens? Well, first of all, we have as the first premise, okay, statement one, a conditional statement, okay? How do we know that it's a conditional statement? Well, the main operator is the horseshoe, okay? So, again, remember that the main operator is the operator that brings together the two largest components of a compound statement. And this horseshoe here is bringing together the H, which is one part of the conditional statement, and the T wedge N, which is the second part of the conditional statement. So here, the H plays the role of the P in this form here of the modus tollens, and the T wedge N plays the role of the Q in the form P wedge Q, okay? Then, as the second premise, which is statement two here, okay, we have the negation of the consequent. Okay, so notice how the consequent here is T wedge N, okay? So for the second premise, which is statement two, we have T wedge N being negated, okay? So we have the negation of the consequent as the second premise. Notice that this is the case with the general form of the modus tollens, okay? We have here the negation of the consequent, okay, as the second premise, okay? We also have the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement, okay? And the antecedent, notice, was H, and here we have the negation of H, okay? And H played the role of P in this form here of the modus tollens, okay? So we have not P in this case, and here then again, we have not P as the conclusion, okay? So this is a modus tollens. Here, again, we have another example of the modus tollens, okay? So in this case, we also have a conditional statement as one of the premises, and we know that it's a conditional statement because the horseshoe is the main operator. And then as the second statement, which is the second premise, we have the negation of the consequent of that conditional statement. And the consequent here plays the role of Q, whereas the antecedent here plays the role of P in this form, Okay, so this negation C actually plays the role of the negation Q, okay, in this form here for the modus tollens, okay? Then, as the conclusion, we again have the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement that was the first premise, okay? And that antecedent played the role of the P in this form here, so the negation of P will play the role of the conclusion here in the form, okay? So you can see how this is also a modus tollens, okay? Now here we have an example of one argument that is not a modus tollens, okay? Well, why is it not a modus tollens? Well, first of all, again, we don't have a conditional statement as one of the premises, okay? Notice how statement number one here, which is the first premise, is not a conditional statement because the main operator is a destructive wedge, okay? And the second premise here is a negation. It's not a conditional statement, okay? So this will not be a modus tollens merely for that reason alone. However, let's say that the wedge here for the first premise was actually a conditional statement, okay? Even if we made that one change, this would still not be an example of a modus tollens. Why would it not be an example of a modus tollens? Well, remember that the second premise for a modus tollens has to be the negation of the consequent, 
that is the conditional statement, okay? Well, here we don't have the negation of the consequent that is given in the conditional statement of the first premise. Notice how the consequent is R wedge S, and here for the second statement, which is the second premise, we have the negation of Q, okay? So this here is not the negation of the consequent of the conditional statement given in the first premise, which makes this also not a modus tollens, okay? Now let's say that we change that so that instead of having not Q here, tilde Q, we actually have tilde R wedge S, okay? And you gotta make sure that you put the parentheses in there because you're negating the entire consequent, okay? If you didn't have the parentheses here, you would be suggesting that you're only negating the R, which then would not be the negation of the consequent of the conditional statement, okay? So let's say we have here the negation of R wedge S, okay? Would that make this a modus tollens? No. Okay. Why would this not be a modus tollens? Because look at the conclusion. Okay. Remember, the conclusion of a modus tollens has to be the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement given in one of the premises. Okay. And here, the negation, which is the conclusion, is not the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement. It's simply negation L. Okay? And the antecedent of the conditional statement is actually L horseshoe Q. Okay? So the conclusion is not the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement that is given as a premise. So this is, again, not a modus tollens. However, if we change the conclusion to negation L horseshoe Q, then with all these changes, we would have a modus tollens. But all these changes were not given to us, right? We're actually given this argument here, and this argument here is not a modus tollens. Another thing that you should know is that modus tollens, like the modus tollens, is always going to be a valid argument form, okay? So that any time you have an argument that takes the form of the modus tollens will be a valid argument. How do we know this? Again, we can construct a truth table for this argument, okay? So notice how we have the truth table for this argument form here, okay? And when you look at this truth table, okay, after you've constructed it, you'll see that you'll find no single row where you have all true premises and a false conclusion. You can have true, and here, okay, the truth value for tilde Q will be the truth values that's under the tilde, okay? So if you have true, false, you'll have a false conclusion. If you have false, true, you have a false conclusion. If you have true, false, you'll have a true conclusion. And if you have true, true, you'll have a true conclusion, okay? So there's actually no row in this truth table for this argument form where you'll have all true premises and a false conclusion, which means this argument form is valid, okay? And if this argument form is valid, then any argument that takes this form will always be valid as well because the validity of the argument is dependent on its form or structure, not the content of the argument. So the modus ponens and the modus tollens are two examples of valid argument forms. Let's look at an example of an invalid argument form, okay? So here we have the fallacy of affirming the consequent, which takes this form over here. Notice how in this form, okay, which is the structure of an argument, we have a conditional statement as one of the premises, okay? And then as the second premise, we have the consequent of the conditional that's being asserted. And then as the conclusion, we have the antecedent of the conditional that is being asserted, okay? Now, we know that this is an invalid form because we can do a truth table for this form, and by doing so, we can find at least one row where you have all true premises and a false conclusion, okay? So here is the truth table for this argument form here, and this column here represents all the possible truth values for the conditional statement, okay, because it's under the horseshoe, okay? And here is the second premise, okay, which is the Q, and here are all the possible truth values for the second premise, and here is the conclusion, which is P, okay, so this is all the possible truth values for the conclusion. And notice when you look here, 
you can find at least one row where you have all true premises and a false conclusion. Okay? So this form or structure of an argument is actually invalid, which means that any argument that takes this form or structure will be an invalid argument. Okay? And notice again, like the modus ponens and modus tollens, we have a form here given to you using statement variables. So you can replace the P and the Q's okay, consistently throughout the argument with any statement, either simple or compound, and when you do so, you will still have an invalid argument. Why? Because it will take the form or structure or pattern of reasoning, basically, of an affirming the consequence. Okay? Now let's look at another invalid form. Okay, so here we have the fallacy of denying the antecedent. This is another form that is invalid, like the fallacy of affirming the consequence. In this form, you have a conditional statement as one of the premises, and then as the second premise, you have the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement, okay? And then you have as the conclusion, the negation of the consequence of the conditional statement. Okay, so here you have also an invalid form. How do we know that it is invalid? Well, you can do a truth table for this argument form as well. All the truth values that are underneath this uh, conditional horseshoe will give you the possible truth values for the statement that is the conditional statement. And all the truth values that occur underneath this uh, negation tilde will give you the truth values for the negation P, which is the second premise of the argument, and then the truth values that occur under the negation for negation Q will give you all the possible truth values that the conclusion can have, which is tilde Q. Okay? Now, if you look at these truth values, you can find at least one row where you will have all true premises and a false conclusion. True, true, and false. Okay? So because you have this row here, which gives you all true premises and a false conclusion, this tells you that it is possible for an argument that takes this form to have all true premises and a false conclusion, which then will tell you that that argument, which will take this form, will be invalid. Okay? So this is also a invalid argument form. Now let's compare the four argument forms that we've discussed so far because they're, they look really, really similar. It's very easy for people to confuse them, okay? Here we have the valid argument forms here, modus ponens and modus tollens, and then here we have the fallacy of affirming the consequence and the fallacy of denying the antecedent. These two are valid, okay, and these two are invalid, okay? Now, notice, the fallacy of affirming the consequent looks really, really similar to modus ponens, okay? It is the case that both have a conditional statement as one of its premises, okay? However, notice that in the second premise for modus ponens, you have the antecedent of the conditional that's being asserted, Whereas for the second premise of the fallacy of affirming the consequent, you have the consequent that is being asserted, okay? This is actually one way to be able to distinguish, okay, the modus ponens from the fallacy of affirming the consequent. It's also one way for you to understand or memorize the name for fallacy of affirming the consequent. This name refers to the fact that this argument affirms the consequence of the conditional statement that is one of its premises in its second premise, okay? Here, modus ponens is referring to the positive mode. And what that suggests is that the premise as well as the conclusion is asserting a positive claim. So you have the positive assertion of the antecedent of the conditional as the second premise. Then, as the conclusion, you have the positive assertion of the consequence of the conditional that's given in one of the premises. Okay? Whereas here, in affirming the consequent, you have as the conclusion the assertion of the antecedent of the conditional statement that is given in the premises. Okay? So these two forms, although they look very similar, are two different argument forms. Okay? Which means that any kind of substitution where you replace the P's and the Q's 
okay, with a statement, either simple or compound, will give you two different kinds of arguments, okay? Also, the modus ponens will always be valid, whereas the affirming the consequent will always be invalid, okay? Here you can also compare the modus tollens with the fallacy of denying the antecedent. These look very similar as well. However, one of them is valid, the modus tollens, and the other one, the fallacy of denying the antecedent, is invalid, okay? Now notice the differences here. Although they look very similar, again, they use conditional statements, okay, as one of the premises. However, unlike modus ponens and affirming the consequent, the second premises are very different, okay? So notice here, the second premise, okay, which is the tilde Q, is the negation of the consequent, okay, of the conditional statement, okay? Where in this side here, when you have the denying the antecedent, the second premise is the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement, okay, which was the P. So although these look very similar, they are different distinct forms, okay? Here, again, you also have, as the conclusion, okay, the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement, okay? Whereas here, as the conclusion, you have the negation of the consequent of the conditional statement, okay? So these are very different forms, although they look very similar, okay? And one way for you to memorize the differences between these forms is that the fallacy of denying the antecedent, okay, refers to the fact that in this argument form, for the second premise, you have the negation of the antecedent of the conditional statement that is one of its premises, okay? And here you have modus tollens, which means negative mode, okay? And the reason why it's called a modus tollens is because one of its premises, as well as the conclusion, are both negations, okay? Unlike the modus ponens, which is positive mode, okay? where you have one of the premises and the conclusion that is a positive assertion, not a negation, okay? Now, these are argument forms that are given to you in propositional logic, okay? However, you can actually understand, again, why these are invalid forms of argument and these are valid if you think about these argument forms in terms of ordinary language, okay? So we talked about modus ponens a little bit. Now, if P equals so I'm going to write this down. So let's say that we have a statement H, okay? And this statement equals Socrates was human, okay? And then we also have statement M, okay? And statement M equals Socrates was mortal, okay? Now, if we took these two statements and replaced them in the argument form, in this case, we're going to replace P with H, okay? So this will become H for Q, and then we're going to replace the Q with the M, so this will become H horseshoe M, okay? And again, we're going to have to do this consistently throughout the argument, so P becomes H, and the Q becomes M, okay? then we will have this argument here, okay? So this argument will take the form or structure of the modus ponens, okay? And if we read this into ordinary language, it would be, if Socrates was human, then Socrates would be mortal. Socrates was human, so Socrates is mortal. And if you think about this argument, it makes sense that if these two premises were true, if it's true that if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, and it was also true that Socrates was human, then it would make sense that the conclusion, Socrates was mortal, would immediately follow from the given premises, okay? That's why this is a valid argument, okay? Now let's look at this argument form here, the affirming the consequent. If we made the same replacement, okay? So we replace P with H, and we replace Q with M, okay? We would have H or shoot M for the first premise, and then for the second premise, we would have M, okay, for the second premise, and then for the conclusion, we would have H, okay? We would then have this argument here, which is again an affirming the consequence, 
And in ordinary language, you would read this as follows. If Socrates was human, then he was mortal. Socrates was mortal, so Socrates was human. Now, if you think about this argument, the truth of the premises will not guarantee the truth of the conclusion. Okay? Think about it. If it was true that if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, okay? And it was also true that Socrates was mortal, those two premises, even if they were both true, would not guarantee that Socrates was human. Why? Consider this. Maybe the Socrates that I'm talking about is my pet bird Socrates, okay? So it would still be true if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, and it would still be true that Socrates is mortal. My pet bird Socrates is mortal, okay? But it would not be true, the conclusion, that Socrates was human, okay? So this argument form here, even if the premises were true, would not guarantee the truth of the conclusion, which would make it an invalid argument. Okay, so let's now look at these two argument forms here, okay, the modus tollens and the fallacy of denying the antecedent. If we made the same substitutions here with this form, replacing the P with the statement H and replacing the Q with the statement M, we would have H horseshoe M as one of the premises, and then we would have not M as the second premise, and then we would have not H as the conclusion, okay? Now, consider this argument in ordinary language, okay? This argument would say, if Socrates was human, then Socrates was mortal, okay? And the second premise would be, Socrates was not mortal, okay? So the conclusion would be, Socrates was not human. Now, if you think about this argument, it is the case that if both the premises were true, then the conclusion would be guaranteed, okay? If it was true that if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, and it was also true that Socrates was not mortal, then it would have to follow that Socrates was not human, okay? So if these premises were true, the conclusion would be guaranteed, okay? And this argument would be valid, okay? So any argument that actually takes this form of the modus tollens would have the same kind of reasoning, okay? So any argument that is a modus tollens would be valid as well. Now look at this argument here, the fallacy of denying the antecedent. Now if we made the same substitutions again, we would have H horseshoe M as one of the premises, and then we would have not H as the second premise, and then as the conclusion we would have not M, okay? Now consider this argument in ordinary language. In ordinary language this would read, if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, Socrates was not human, so Socrates was not mortal, okay? Now, if you think about that argument, you would notice that even if the premises were true, the conclusion would not be guaranteed, okay? So even if it were true that if Socrates was human, then he was mortal, and it's also true that Socrates was not human, the conclusion that Socrates was not mortal would not be guaranteed. Why? Consider, I might be talking about my pet bird Socrates, okay? Even if I'm talking about my pet bird Socrates, or any other living being that is named Socrates that's not human, okay? It would still be true that if Socrates was human, then Socrates would be mortal, so the first conditional statement would be true, and it would still be true that Socrates was not human, okay? But it would not be guaranteed to you, given that those things are both true, that Socrates was not mortal, okay? My pet bird Socrates is mortal, okay? So because, in this case, the truth of the premises would not guarantee the truth of the conclusion, this would be an invalid argument, okay? Not only that, but the reason why it's invalid is because it has the form of the denying the antecedent, okay? So any argument that actually has this form or this structure or this pattern of reasoning would always be invalid, okay? So one thing that you should learn at this point or one lesson to take away from this is that if you want to create a good deductive argument, you may use the form of the modus ponens or the form of the modus tollens, okay? Both of these forms, if you use them in order to create a deductive argument, you will have at least an argument with good reasoning. To have a sound argument, however, you have to make sure that the premises that you actually construct in accordance with this form are actually true premises.
okay? But if you use these forms alone, at least what you will be guaranteed is good reasoning, okay? However, anytime you have an argument that uses either one of these forms, that of affirming the consequent or denying the antecedent, you will not have a good argument. You'll automatically have an unsound argument. So you should not use these forms. Okay? If you are trying to construct a good argument. Not only that, but anytime you do see an argument that uses these forms, you can automatically be assured that those are not good arguments. Okay? Next.